it's not there. Ah, I found it. There it is, the little red hen. And this one. It's going to be at the very end. 
This is a newer edition of the enormous turnip. It's probably not going to be th yet. It's 50p now. So this is um, Ladybird Books started to um, morph into a new generation and reprinted a lot of their old classics. Um, and it's by Stephanie. So this 
this is um, a reprint. The original would have been back in 1969, but this is a much older um, version using the same illustrations, thankfully. Ladybird started to mark them all by grade 1, grade 2, and grade 3. Grade 1 being the easiest, grade 2 being the, the medium, and grade 3 being the, the difficulty, the ones with the kind of older children.
was the princess and the frog which is here the princess and the frog and this again is another school book um, which was in County Durham which is not too far Often. 
is the fairest of them all. The mirror always replied, Thou, O Queen, art the fairest of all. The Queen was always content when she heard this reply, for she knew that the magic mirror could speak nothing but the truth. and spoon. 
worst of them all. She could not believe her ears when she heard this reply. Thou, O Queen, art exceedingly fair, but the truth I must speak, and at this I do swear. Snow White is not dead, but living still, in a little house far over the hill. And though thou, O Queen, art certainly fair, this child's beauty doth make her more fair. Then great was the anger of the Queen. She knew that the mirror never lied. Her huntsman had deceived her. The Queen's jealousy would not let her rest as long as she knew that anyone was more beautiful than she was. She determined to find Snow White and kill her herself. But how could she do this? She knew that she must not let Snow White recognize her. Finally, she decided to disguise herself as an old peddler woman who called at people's houses selling things from her basket. herself in old clothes and painted her face. No one could possibly have recognized the beautiful queen. She then traveled through the forest until she came to the dwarf's cottage by the mountain. She knocked on the door and shouted, laces and ribbons for sale, pretty laces and ribbons. Snow White looked out the window Herself. What harm can this poor old woman be to me? Snow White opened the door and the woman brought her basket into the cottage. Snow White chose some pretty pink laces for her stairs. The old woman offered to lace up Snow White's corset. Snow White, suspecting nothing, agreed. Then the Queen laced her so tightly that the child could not breathe, and she fell on the floor as if she were dead. In the evening, when the dwarfs returned home, they were shocked to find their beloved Snow White lying on the floor as if she were dead. with new things to sell. Again, 
before the mirror asking mirror mirror on the wall among the ladies in this land who is the fairest of them all just as before the mirror replied thou O queen art exceedingly fair but the truth I must speak and this I do swear Snow White is not dead but living still in a little house far over the hill and thought certainly fair, this child's beauty doth make her more fair. At these words the queen stamped her feet and beat on the looking glass in her rage. Snow White shall die, she vowed, even if her costs be my life.
she saw the woman happily eating one half of the apple, she thought she could do no harm in eating the other half herself. So she took the rosy half of the apple and bit into it. No sooner had she done that than she fell down dead. The queen laughed a horrible laugh and cried, This time the dwarfs can't waken you. Thus, the jealous queen was finally content. When the dwarfs returned home in the evening, there lay Snow White on the floor, no longer breathing, yet they had hoped that they might be able to revive her. They unlaced her stairs, combed her hair, and washed her face, but they could not find how she had died. stood round her and wept, saying, Our beautiful Snow White is dead. For three days and nights they stood around her, mourning. At the end of three days, the dwarfs knew they must bury their beloved Snow White, yet they could not bear to do so, for she looked as though she was still alive. So they made a glass coffin. In order that they might still see her, they wrote on the side in letters of gold that her name was Snow White and she was a king's daughter. The dwarfs carried the glass coffin to the top of the mountain. When they each took it in turn to sit always by the coffin, day and night. There Snow White lay as if still alive but sleeping with her skin as white as snow her cheeks as red as blood and her hair as black as ebony even the birds came and wept to see her lying so still Snow White lay in the glass coffin for many years and still she looked as if she were alive and only sleeping one day it happened that a king's son found the glass coffin on top of the mountain. He could not take his eyes from the beautiful girl within. He gazed at her and fell in love with her. Let me have the coffin, he begged the dwarfs, and I will give you whatever you ask. But they only answered, we would not part with Snow White for all the gold in the world. The prince continued to plead with them. I cannot live without her, he said. If you give her to me, I will cherish her all my life. At length, the dwarfs took pity on the prince and agreed to give him the coffin. As the prince's servants were carrying the coffin down the mountainside, they stumbled on the roots of a tree. The coffin was so badly jolted that the piece of apple which was stuck in Snow White's throat was flung out. She opened her eyes, lifted the lid of the coffin and sat up. Where am I? she cried in surprise. The king was overjoyed to see her alive. He told her all that had happened and how he had fallen in love with her me to my father's palace and we shall be married he begged and Snow White agreed she said goodbye to the dwarfs who had been so kind to her and had loved her so dearly although they were sad to lose her they seemed content to know she was alive and she would be happy with the prince Never.
A wedding feast was arranged for Snow White and the Prince, and it happened that Snow White's stepmother was among those invited to the feast. When the queen, dressed in her finest clothes, was ready for the wedding, she stood before her mirror and asked, Mirror, mirror on the wall, among the ladies in this land, who is the fairest of them all? Once upon a time, there was a poor miller who had one beautiful daughter. The next day, the king sent for the miller. When the miller stood before the king, he was rather frightened. Instead of remaining quiet, the foolish man said the first silly thing that popped into his head. I have a daughter who can spin straw into gold, he said. Your daughter is indeed clever if she can do as you say, said the king. Bring her to me tomorrow and we shall see. The next day the miller took his daughter to the king's castle. The king into a room that was almost filled with straw. The only other things in the room were a stool, a spindle, and some wheels. Now set to work, said the king, and if by tomorrow morning you have not spun this straw into gold, Round and one reel was full, the mannequin put on a 
another reel were, were, were three times round and the second reel was full and so it went on all night by morning all the straw was spun and all the reels were full of gold whereupon the little man disappeared at sunrise the king arrived he was astonished and more than delighted to see so much gold yet he was not satisfied the sight the girl that if all the straw was not spun into gold before the next morning she must die once more when she was left alone the girl began to cry in a moment the door flew open and the mannequin stood before her I spin this straw into gold asked the tiny man the ring on my finger replied the miller's daughter the mannequin took the ring and sat down before the spinning wheel he spun straw all night until all the reels were full of gold then once more he disappeared sunrise and again he was delighted to see all of the gold yet still he was not satisfied he led the poor girl into a third room even larger than the other two it too was full of straw this time the king said to the girl Spin this into gold before morning, and you shall be my queen. When the girl sat alone weeping, the queer little man appeared for the third time. What will you give me if I spin this straw for you this time? Alas, I have nothing more I can give, sobbed the poor girl. Then promise me that if you become queen, you'll give me your first child, said the mannequin. I may never become queen, nor yet have a child. So she promised. At that, the mannequin once more spun all the straw into gold. arrived early the next morning he was overjoyed at the sight of all the gold he reminded himself that not only was the miller's daughter beautiful but also she'd brought him great riches so he kept his promise he married the miller's daughter 
and she became his queen. suddenly appeared in the Queen's bedroom. Now give me what you promised, he said to the Queen, as he pointed to the sleeping baby. The poor Queen was horrified and clutched her baby tightly to her. The Queen offered the mannequin all the riches in her kingdom would release her from her promise. The tiny man refused them all. A human child will be dearer to me than all of the riches in your kingdom, he said to the queen. At his words, the poor queen wept so bitterly that the tiny man took pity on her. I will give you three days he said, and if in that time you can guess my name, you shall keep your child. That night, the queen lay awake, trying to remember every name she'd ever heard. sent for a messenger. She told him to ride all over the country, collecting all the boy's names he could find. When the little man came the next day, the queen repeated her long list of names, but after each name, the mannequin said, No, that is not The next morning, the queen sent out her messenger to another country. He came back with a long list of the queerest names she'd ever heard. The queen repeated all these strange names to the little man on his second visit. After each name, he shook his head and said, No, that is not my name. The poor queen was in despair. On the third day, it was very late when the messenger returned. I've not been able to find one new name, he said, but as I came to the high mountain at the end of the forest, I saw a little house. In front of the house, a fire was burning. The queerest little man was hopping and jumping around the fire, went on the messenger, and this is what he was singing. Although today I brew and bake, tomorrow the queen's old child I take, the guessing game she'll never win, for my name is Rumpelstiltskin. At hearing this, the queen clapped her hands with joy. 
When the mannequin arrived, she pretended that she still did not know his name. Is your name Twinkletoe? she asked. No, that is not my name, he replied. Is it Chagrabanda? she asked. No, that is not my name, he replied. Does it happen to be Rumpelstiltskin? The mannequin was furious. A witch has told you, a witch has told you, he shrieked. He stamped his foot in anger. He stamped so hard that his right leg went right through the floor. At this, his anger increased. He seized his leg with both hands and began to pull with all his might. He pulled so hard that at last his leg came out of the hole. Then Rumpelstiltskin stumbled furiously out of the room and was never heard of again. Jack and the Beanstalk Once upon a time there was a widow who only had one son named Jack. He was a lazy boy. He would not go out and work for his living, nor would he do much work for his mother at home. Yet, Jack was not altogether a bad boy. He was kind-hearted and pleasant, and his mother was very fond of him. Jack and his mother lived in a tiny cottage, and they were very poor. As time went on, the widow grew poorer and poorer, while Jack grew lazier and lazier. At last the day arrived when the widow had nothing left in the world except one cow. She then said to her son, Tomorrow you must take our poor cow to market and sell her. She's all that we have left in the world, so be sure you get a good price for her. Next morning Jack got up early and set off for market with the cow. On the road, he met a butcher who asked him where he was going with the cow. I'm taking her to market to sell her, sir, Jack told him. I'll make a bargain with you, said the butcher to Jack. I will exchange these beans for your cow. He showed Jack some strange looking beans, all different colours, which he was carrying in his hat. I'd be a fool to exchange my cow for your beans, said Jack. Ah, but these are not ordinary beans, replied the butcher. They are magic beans. Jack thought what a fine thing it would be to have some magic beans, so he agreed to the bargain. He gave the cow to the butcher, put the beans in his pocket, and set off for home. Jack's mother was surprised to see him back so early. She thought he must have got a fine price for the cow. Look, mother, cried Jack. I've made a good bargain. I exchanged our cow for these beans. His mother was very, very angry. You bad, stupid boy, she said. Now we shall surely starve. In her anger, she threw the beans out of the window and pushed Jack upstairs to bed without any supper. But they're magic beans, will Jack, so I thought it would be a good bargain. His 
mother was far too angry to reply. The next morning, Jack woke early feeling very hungry. His room was much darker than usual. When he went to his window, he found he could barely see out. There seemed to be a large tree in the garden where none had grown before. Jack ran downstairs and discovered that it was not a tree grown in the garden, but a huge beanstalk. It had sprung up during the night from the magic beans that his mother had thrown out of the window. The beanstalk was taller and stronger than any tree, and it had grown so quickly that its top was out of sight. Jack immediately began to climb the beanstalk, but it was hard work, pulling himself upwards from branch to branch. But Jack was a strong boy, and he was determined to reach the top. He climbed and climbed and climbed, yet whenever he looked up, the top of the beanstalk still stretched upwards out of sight. of climbing, Jack reached the top of the beanstalk and stepped off into a wild, bare country. Not a tree or a blade of grass was to be seen, and there was not a house in sight. A long road led away into the distance. Soon he met with an old, old woman. Good morning, Jack, she said, and Jack was amazed that she knew his name. I know all about you, said the old woman. You are now in a country that belongs to a wicked ogre. When you were a baby, this ogre killed your father and stole all that he possessed. That is why your mother is now so poor. You must try and punish this ogre and get back your father's wealth, she continued. If you are a brave boy, I shall try to help you. At that, the old woman disappeared and Jack went forward along the lonely road. Towards evening, Jack came to a castle. He knocked on the great door and a woman opened it. She looked startled when she saw Jack. I'm very tired and hungry, said Jack. Please, can you give me some supper and a bed for the night? Oh, my poor boy, cried the woman. Do you not know where you are? My husband is an ogre and he eats people. He will be sure to find you and eat you for his supper. Jack felt afraid when he heard this, but he was too tired and hungry to go another step. So he pleaded with the woman to take him in. At last, the ogre's wife agreed and she led Jack into her kitchen. She set a fine supper before him which Jack enjoyed so much, he soon forgot his fears. Scarcely had he finished eating when the ground was shaken by the sound of heavy, stamping feet. Then three loud knocks were heard on the door. It was the ogre returning home. Jack's heart began to thump. The ogre's wife began to shake. She snatched Jack up and pushed him into the oven which unfortunately was nearly cold. Then she went to let her husband in.
The ogre stalked into the castle, sniffed around the kitchen and roared. Fee, fi, fo, fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive or be he dead, I grind his bones to make my bread. Nonsense, said the ogre's wife. You're dreaming. And she set an enormous meal on the table before him. As the ogre was hungry, he sniffed no more, but sat down and began to eat. Jack peeped at the ogre through a crack in the oven door, and he was astonished to see how much the ogre ate and how quickly he pushed food into his mouth. When the ogre had finished his meal, he shouted to his wife, Bring me my hen. She brought it to him, and he sent her off to bed without a word of thanks. Then the ogre placed the hen on the table and shouted, Lay! Whereupon the hen laid a golden egg. Another, roared the ogre, and another egg was laid. Again and again, in a voice of thunder, the ogre shouted, Lay! And the hen appeared, until twelve golden eggs were on the table. When the ogre fell asleep in his chair, he snored so loudly that the castle shook. As soon as Jack heard the snores of the ogre, he crept out of the oven, seized the hen, tucked it under his arm, and tiptoed out of the castle. Then he set off running along the road as fast as he ever could. On and on he ran, till at last he came to the top of the beanstalk. He climbed down quickly and took the wonderful hen to his mother. She, the poor woman, was delighted to see her son again, and when Jack set the hen on the table and ordered it to lay a golden egg, she could not believe her eyes. Every day the hen laid another golden egg by selling the eggs. Jack and his mother were able to live very comfortably and had no need to worry. They lived happily in this way for many a long day. But after some time, Jack began to long for more adventure. He thought of what the old woman had told him and of how the ogre had stolen all his father's riches. Jack determined to visit the ogre's castle again, disguised himself so the ogre's wife would not know him. He then began to climb the beanstalk for a second time. Just as before, Jack reached the castle towards evening and knocked on the door. Then the ogre's wife opened the door and he said, I should be glad of food and rest, good woman, for I am hungry and tired. You cannot stay here, said the ogre's wife. Once before I took in a tired and hungry boy and he stole my husband's wonderful hen. Jack pretended to think that the boy who had stolen the hen was a rascal. He chatted so pleasantly to the ogre's wife that she felt she could not refuse him a meal, so she let him come in. Jack had eaten a good supper. The 
the ogre's wife hid him in a cupboard. She had just done so when in stamped the ogre. He sniffed all around the kitchen and roared, Fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. Nonsense, said the ogre's wife, you are dreaming. And she set an enormous supper before him. After the supper, the ogre roared, Fetch me my money bags. His wife brought the bags and went off to bed. The ogre emptied all the money onto the table and counted it over and over again before putting it back in the bags. Then he fell asleep. As soon as Jack heard the ogre's loud snores, he crept out of the cupboard and picked up the money bags. They were much heavier than he expected, but he had managed to sling them over his shoulder. He then let himself out of the castle as quietly as he could. Jack could not run along the road because the money bags were so heavy and he was afraid that the ogre would waken and follow him, but he reached the top of the beanstalk safely. Once more Jack's mother was overjoyed to see him, and when he emptied the money bags on the table, she was astonished. Such sweet 
As soon as Jack heard the loud snores of the ogre, he jumped out of the copper and seized the harp. No sooner had he touched it, the harp called out, Master, Master. The ogre woke up with a fury and to see Jack making off with his harp. You are the boy who stole my hen and my money bags, he bellowed. still drowsy with sleep and heavy with food and wine so he was not able to be speedy as usual yet he staggered to his feet and set off after Jack Jack was terrified but he did not put the harp down slinging it over his shoulder he ran for his life towards the beanstalk and all of the way along the road the harp continued to cry master Jack was too frightened and too short of breath to even think of saying stop to it. Looking over his shoulder, Jack saw the ogre striding after him. Then he ran as he had never run before in his life. Jack reached the top of the beanstalk safely, but the ogre was close behind him. He scrambled and slid down the beanstalk, shouting, Mother, mother, bring me the axe quickly. The ogre is coming. Then Jack's mother picked up her skirts and ran more quickly than she had ever run since she was a little girl. She brought her son the axe. By then the ogre was climbing rapidly down the beanstalk. Jack swung the axe with all his strength and gave one mighty blow at the beanstalk. The beanstalk toppled down and there was a tremendous thud as the ogre was thrown headlong to the ground. He lay dead in Jack's garden and was so big he filled it from end to Pointing to the ogre, Jack said to his mother, he killed my father and robbed us of all our wealth. At that moment, there appeared the old woman who had talked to Jack. She told them that she was really a fairy, but she had lost her magic power and had been unable to prevent the ogre killing Jack's father. It was she who had made Jack take the magic in exchange for the cow. She had wanted him to climb the beanstalk and she had led him to the ogre's castle and helped him there. Your troubles are now over, the fairy told Jack and his mother. You will want for nothing and you'll be happy as long as you live. It happened as the fairy had said and Jack and his mother lived happily ever after. a poor boy who was called Dick Whittington. His mother and father were dead and he had no one to care for him. Dick lived in a small village in the country. He tried to work for his living but he did not always find work to do. Dick was very poor. His clothes were sometimes he had very little to eat. In those days, people did not often travel far from the village in which they lived. Dick's village was a long way from London. When the village people talked of London, they spoke of it as a said that all the people in the city of London were rich. They even said that the 
streets of London were paved with gold. Dick listened to these tales, and he longed to go to London. Dick thought that if he went to London, he would be able to pick up gold from the street. first wonderment he began to look for the streets that were paved with gold. Nowhere could he find them. It grew dark and Dick was tired and hungry. He had nowhere to sleep so he curled up into a doorway and went to sleep there. Next morning, Dick tried to find work for himself. He walked along street after street asking people for work, but no one had a job to offer him. When night came, Dick was so weak from hunger and tiredness that he sank down on the nearest doorstep. long. He soon found that the cook was an unkind woman. 
She was always scolding him, and sometimes she used to beat him. Mr. Fitzwarren had a daughter named Alice. She was kind, just like her father, and she knew that the cook was cruel to Dick. Alice took pity on Dick and forbade the cook to hit him. This made things easier for Dick, although he still had to work very hard. Dick's bed was in a cold attic at the top of the house. The attic was overrun with rats and mice. At night, as Dick tried to sleep, the rats and mice ran over his bed. He could not rest. If only I had a cat, thought Dick. She would be a friend to me, and she would chase away all the rats and the mice. But all the money that Dick had in the world was one penny. The next day, Dick went to market with his penny in his pocket. There he saw a woman holding a cat in her arms. Please, will you sell me your cat? asked the woman. I'm not sure that I want to sell her, said the woman. She's a grand cat for catching mice. That's just what I need, said Dick. And he pleaded so hard that at last the woman agreed to sell him her cat for one penny. From that day, Dick's life became happier. He loved his cat and looked upon her as his friend. At night, he slept well because his cat chased away all of the rats and the mice. Now, Mr. Fitzwarren had many ships that sailed to distant lands. Whenever a ship sailed, Mr. Fitzwarren let everyone in his house send something with the captain. These things were sold for good prices in other countries. In this way, everyone had the chance to make extra money for himself. One day, Mr. Fitzwarren called all of the servants together. He told them that a ship was ready to sail. Everyone except Dick had something to sell. Do you not want to send something on my ship? asked Mr. Fitzwarren. I have nothing in the world except my cat, replied Dick. Then you must send your cat, said Alice. Poor Dick did not really want to part with his cat, but to please Alice, he agreed at last. The cook made fun of Dick saying, whoever heard of sending a cat on Mr. Fitzwarren's ship, what use will it be? Dick missed his cat and wished he'd never sent her away. Once more, he could not sleep at night because of the mice running over his bed. Dick was so unhappy that he made up his mind to run away. Early one morning, he crept out of the house before anyone was awake. far when the bells of Bow Church began to ring. The bells seemed to be singing this tune to Dick. Turn again, Whittington, Lord Mayor of London. Turn again, Whittington, thrice Mayor of London. If I am to be Lord Mayor of London, thought Dick, I will turn again. So before anyone missed him, he turned back to Mr. Fitzwarren's house and let himself in. the ship, Dick's cat was making herself very useful. The ship was overrun with rats and mice, and Dick's cat was a fine rat catcher, and she soon killed hundreds of them. After sailing for many weeks, the ship came to a far country. The captain sent to the king of the country, asking if he wanted to buy some of the things from the ship. The king then invited the captain to come a wonderful meal was prepared for the king and queen and the captain. Many servants carried the food on gold and silver dishes and set it in front of them. Before anyone could take a bite, hundreds of rats rushed into the room. The servants tried to drive them 
Whittington, 